Okay, good evening, everybody. I think we're going to go ahead and um, get started. So thank you all so much for joining us um, for um, another great webinar tonight. Um, Clem Arboretum and Botanic Garden is uh, really excited to be hosting um, this program as part of Autumn at the Arboretum, uh, which is going through the end of this week, um, Friday. So if you haven't stopped out yet, come on out and um, enjoy free admission for the rest of the week. We've got a straw bale maze set up for kids, um, a smartphone tour that you can learn a little bit more about the fall interest around our grounds and a smartphone scavenger hunt as well. Um, the, the tours will be up throughout fall. And so we don't have, um, we're not quite at peak uh, fall color yet. It's a little early. Um, so the, the smartphone tour and scavenger hunt will be up um, a bit longer as well. So if you can't make it this week, come on out um, anytime this fall and check out the fall colors. Um, my name is Sam Burbach. I am the Director of Education and Programming, and I'm so glad that you all can join us tonight um, from uh, the comfort of your home. And we're uh, getting our presenter from Wisconsin, so we're across state lines here. I would like to say um, that we are very grateful this webinar is being made possible by the Pauline J. and John R. Cook Lecture Fund. So we appreciate um, them being able to support us having all these great speakers um, who are, are going to present to us. So um, without further ado, I will go ahead, we'll get this started and I will pass it over to Carrie Hennessy um, from Johnson's Nursery. And she is going to tell us about um, landscaping with, with winter interest in mind. It's not far off, <laughs> scarily. <laughs> so, um, oh, sorry, um, I always forget this, but just a quick side note with Zoom, you are all muted as participants. So if you have any questions, there's a little Q&A box at the bottom. Go ahead and type your questions in at any point throughout the presentation, and then we'll go ahead and do some uh, question and answer at the end. So feel free to type in um, your questions there. Um, we will get time for that at the end. And now I will pass it over. <laughs> okay, thanks, Sam. Uh, yeah, so my name is Carrie Hennessy. I am a horticulturist and landscape designer at um, Johnson's Nursery in Menominee Falls, Wisconsin, which is basically just, it's the Milwaukee area. So just over the border. And um, I've been there, oh gosh, in March, it was 13 years. And it has been an intensely crazy season, um, very busy, and um, we are heading into my favorite time of year, and um, I'm going to talk to you guys today about how to keep your yards looking interesting, not just through spring, summer, and fall, but also um, when you're doing um, new landscaping, planting trees, also consider winter because, let's face it, it's our longest season. Um, so Johnson's Nursery, you can see our logo right here. We have been in business. Um, this is a third generation company. Um, yes, this logo is based on this huge old 300 year old oak tree on our property. Um, so I guess we've been in business 63 years, I think. Um, but I love living in the Midwest, even though um, the weather can be unpredictable. Uh, we have unpredictable springs, you know, in the growing business, not only do I do landscape design and, design and installation, but our company is also um, a big grower of trees, evergreens, shrubs, and perennials. In fact, we're the largest um, provider of Wisconsin native plants in the area. And, you know, what we look for is a, you know, mild dry spring so we can get as much harvested as possible. And a lot of times that is not what we're getting. And then we transition into our humid summers filled with mosquitoes and road construction. But I think it's all worth it to get to fall. Um, March through October, I work a lot. And, you know, we just, you know, being in the Midwest, we have a limited amount of time to get clients' projects done and in the ground, plants harvested. So I love fall because I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. This is my five-year-old son, Jack. This was taken last fall in our front yard. Um, I get to spend more time with my family and I know that soon the slow quiet pace of winter is just around the corner. And Johnson's Nursery, we, we don't do snow removal which is probably why I like winter so much. Winter is basically, I have more regular hours, you know, you know, eight to 4.30, Monday through Friday. I can take vacation time. It's just, it's not as crazy. 
but not everyone feels the same way I do. Do If you miss being outdoors in the garden, there is lots you can do. You can take a polar plunge. You can go ice skating, skiing, ice fishing. Though really the, the appeal of ice fishing just escapes me sitting on in the very cold, immobile for possibly very little reward. Sledding. I prefer uh, more indoor activities in winter, like baking, sleeping and snuggles with the cats and my son. But we do get outside to play in, our, in the snow. We have a very small backyard, but I have packed it full of plants. We have snowball fights. And um, this picture here, this is a tricolor beach that I planted the day before um, my water broke when I was pregnant with my son. I have a small yard, but so it was important that I pick a specimen tree that was pretty through all seasons. So not only do I get those electric leaves in spring, um, great colors still in summer, and even in fall when it bronzes out, it just creates, you know, just kind of that whole autumnal um, huga feel. Um, but again, I wanted something that still has some interest in winter. So you can see the nice thing about beaches is that they do hold onto their leaves so we get some structure and texture. And this could also be considered a winter landscape, but it does start to lose its appeal in February. Um, the um, suburb I live in in Milwaukee is called West Dallas, and every year Christmas time, there is a neighborhood probably about five block radius that they, most of the neighborhoods just completely go to town with decorating for um, Christmas and donations are um, provided for the MAC fund and Santa's handing out candy canes. It's kind of a big deal in our area. Um, and my community, it seems that they've never met an inflatable decoration they don't like. Though I do um, love the one house that they put lights on their big Norway maple and it transforms into an Acer Electris. This is a lot of work. And when a light goes out, I can't imagine how difficult it is to um, fix a string of lights in the cold. But basically I'm talking about in November to March, we want to keep your yard from looking like this and more like this. This is actually our office building. It's the back door um, that leads out into our employee parking lot. It's really a simple, boring building, but it's surrounded with lovely structure provided by um, trees and perennials and evergreens and grasses and shrubs. It's all about looking at things from a different perspective when you're thinking about um, landscaping for winter. So we're going to start with the obvious for winter color, the evergreens. I hesitated putting Colorado spruces in the presentation because um, of the needle cast fungus that's killing them, but they're still available on the market. They're still in people's yards. And as long as you give them plenty of room and air circulation, you can have beautiful structure in winter. This particular variety is a fat Albert spruce. This is actually in our display gardens at the nursery. And you can see how pretty it is with that horizontal structure, very rigid, able to support a lot of that snow weight. And for those who don't know what I'm talking about with the needle cast fungus, um, it's called Rhizophera, aka needle cast. And it's a fungus that attacks and kills the, um, the spruces. It's particularly bad with Colorado spruces, probably because Colorado spruces, they're used to a more arid um, environment like the Rocky Mountains. And we have very humid summers. And especially when you go into subdivisions and when the spruces were small and cute, that was fine putting them this far apart, but the bigger they get, the less air circulation they, there is and the um, fungi will just spread more quickly. And you can treat it, but it does get expensive over time. So some alternatives to the blue spruce um, are balsam fir, which that is just awesome. The It, it almost looks like, um, like a Pizzelle cookie with the snow on top of it. A Norway spruce is, um, I've heard it can get the needle cast fungus. I have not seen it happen around here. And even though it doesn't have the very rigid structure of a uh, Colorado spruce, it's still very pretty. And it's also um, quite fast growing um, compared to some other spruces. And as they get older, they get more pendulous and they have the really cool long cones. 
if you want something a little less big, we've got um, Arbovites. Um, this is um, pyramidal Arbovites. These are, this is actually a hedge at our nursery that um, divides the sales area from our production area, which is back here. And there's like um, an irrigation um, tunnel right here. So it keeps people from going back there. These we figure were probably planted in the mid seventies. So they've been there a long time and they're just gorgeous in winter. Um, this is also proof that you can't always believe plant tags when you're at a garden center, because I've seen many um, tags that say this pyramidal arbovite only gets six feet tall. You can see it gets a lot taller than that. The problem is that snow can build up on the top and it occasionally needs to be knocked off um, before they splay open like this. So going back here, when these were younger and the um, the branches were not quite as rigid and strong, they would have to come out with the cherry picker sometimes and knock off the wet snow. In the time that I've been there, I don't think we've had to do that yet because they've, they've been there long enough and they they seem to hold up better as they get older. Um, another variety is emerald arbovite. Um, this is a very common one and typically less problematic with the snow because it doesn't have that flat top. It's a little pointier, so it's better from keeping the snow building up on top of it, though that doesn't mean it doesn't have other problems, such as it's one of the favorites for deer browsing. You can get this mushroom look if you don't protect them. And also I've noticed that emerald arborvitaes are more susceptible to winter burn, usually like on the south side of um, where you get that snow glare burning it, or if it's a really windy site, um, I see this burnout more than the pyramidal um, varieties. If you like your arborvitaes on the fatter side, we do have Techni, which has been on the market for ages, or Technito. Um, my company, Johnson's Nursery, actually introduced the Technito about 20 years ago. It's a slower growing, tighter, more compact version. You can see the difference that it's just, it's ultimately denser and it basically looks like a, a mini Techni. That's why we call it Technito. But it can be lovely in winter, nice and green. Um, and it also holds up under snow better than the Techni does. The Techni, because the branching is a little looser, when you get like the heavy ice storms, it can really weigh them down and cause a lot of breakage. But it's still, you know, both are still good trees. Um, just, you know, everything is going to have something that um, might be problematic with it. Um, Scott's pine is, I think, an underused pine. I think people um, use Austrian pines a lot, and they are just riddled with like disease and pest problems. So we've really phased those out. Um, I think Scott's pine is underutilized. They're fairly slow growing, and I think why you don't see them in yards as much is because they can really transition a lot over um, their lifespan. They start out kind of tight and dense. And then as they get older, they really open up and you get to see the orange bark better. And it's just gorgeous in winter. Um, another pine um, that holds snow well is blue Japanese white pine. Here's a close up here. Um, you could try a weeping white pine instead of just a regular Eastern white pine or native pine. Also, this tends to hold up a little better underneath um, snow and ice. Here it is in winter. And I think this is, yeah, this is in our display gardens. Um, something you consider, consider, and we've done um, in other sites is you put two together and have them create a nice archway. That's really cool in winter. Um, an underused pine that um, contractors are finally starting to get wise to. Um, I don't know how many of you may be familiar with this one. It's called a Swiss stone pine. And um, not native to the US, um, as the name would suggest, but it is where um, pine nuts come from, if you like pesto. Um, that's a key ingredient. And I've always thought that Swiss stone pines were really pretty, um, but they are slower growing, but they just, they have cool structure and they're like really low maintenance, don't have many pest problems. But we had that polar vortex of, I guess that was 2012, 2013, Pretty much every pine in our fields had bad winter burn, except the Swiss stone pine. Turns out they're incredibly cold tolerant. 
Also, the um, branches are a little more flexible. So sometimes the rigidity of like an Austrian pine or even a Scots pine, if you get real heavy snows, that can cause breakage. And I really haven't seen it on this one. And here's a close up of the really cool cones. They're nice and fat cones. They can get pretty big like that. For evergreen shrubs, I mean, branch style, ho style house, who hasn't seen a, a, a yew hedge um, around a foundation? Um, this is um, Texas cuspidata variety. Lots of problems with yews though. Not only, you know, do the deer eat them in winter, but they don't hold up well under snow. And also they're just, they're kind of high maintenance because even though, I guess if you really like structured things and you don't mind pruning a shrub twice a year, a U is for you. But with um, urban sprawl, you know, back in the 60s, 70s, when everybody was, um, these subdivisions were popping up, I think people thought U's were like the answer to landscaping because, oh my gosh, it's evergreen. Oh my gosh, it's easy to take care of. But then as deer start populations started losing their territory, they moved in the subdivisions and just turned them all into snacks. So um, I hardly ever use use anymore unless some, someone specifically wants them. Um, definitely I've veered more towards using boxwoods. Um, now we use boxwoods that are um, Korean hybrids, not the English hybrids, not like what Martha Stewart has at her house where she has to wrap them in burlap every winter to prevent winter burn. The Korean um, species are and hybrids are much hardier and um, as long as they're well hydrated going into winter, you don't have to wrap them unless it's like an area that gets um, a lot of exposed to exposure to winds and um, salt spray from a road. Um, but boxwoods are great. They can take full sun to full shade. They're deer resistant. There is a boxwood blight that I know down around the Clem Arboretum area, there was another nursery that um, did find boxwood blight in their fields. When that happens, you have to completely destroy them. You can't grow boxwoods anymore. So my company is taking incredible steps to keep boxwood blight out of our fields. Any liners we buy have been tested. We quarantine stuff that comes in that could potentially be a vector for the blight. And um, we're also shifting our boxwood production to an area that's basically kind of in the middle of nowhere where um, um, the blight is less likely to get to it. So we're taking really big precautions because boxwoods are a huge part of our business. Um, caveat with boxwoods, just be careful if you're putting them near a sidewalk, um, especially I see this a lot with like assisted li living facilities where you, know, you have to keep heavy salting so people don't slip and fall or like commercial properties. Boxwoods do not like that. Um, a more informal evergreen shrub um, for native enthusiasts that you might know of is the Old Field Common Juniper. It turns a purple bronze color in winter, which is pretty unusual for um, an evergreen per se. Um, this guy, the common juniper, like sandy, dry soils, you'll find these growing on the bluffs in um, Door County, Wisconsin, or like on lake shores with um, sandy bluffs or like limestone, you know, because they don't need that much structure for rooting into. They get really cool fruits that the birds will eat as well. It's just an unusual addition, and especially if you want to include more native um, things in your landscape, this is a good one. Now let's get a little more variety in the winter landscape and introduce our deciduous beauties. They, these are the ones I absolutely love in a winter landscape. This is a view from, um, you can see our production facility, one of our production areas behind here. You can see our hoop houses sleeping for winter. So we're gonna start with trees that are good in the winter because of either their barks and or branching habits. Shagwar hickory is a very regal um, native tree that um, she's slow growing, but she is worth it. Um, gets this great gold foliage. They're, they've already started turning colors now. And they do get hickory nuts, which they're in the same family as pecans. Tastes very similar, but they're a lot harder to crack into than a pecan. And then when she doesn't have her leaves, you still get to see that great peeling bark. Good habitat for wildlife. Um, Coxbur hawthorn has the white flowers in spring, good screening plant in summer. 
And though it is a nightmare to prune because of the tight horizontal branching habit, it makes a great hiding spot for birds um, escaping predators, especially in winter where um, they have less camouflage. If you have the thornless species, be careful. Those are wicked. River birch. The bark is super cool in summer, but it's even better in winter when you have nothing else except surrounded by white in the landscape. There's a close up. And river birches, when they're young, they're not going to be as peeling. It's just you got to be patient and wait for this to start happening. All that great cinnamon texture coming off of the tree. Here's a photo of a bunch of birches in her holding yard covered in snow. Um, Musclewood has a special place in our heart at Johnson's Nursery. Um, it's a native understory tree that um, I would say like 15 years ago, most people hadn't heard of in Musclewood. So we've done a lot with um, growing them from seed and allowing them to cross pollinate so we can get better form and habit in this great electric fall color. So they're beautiful in fall, but when the leaves drop, you can really see how it gets its name Musclewood, that it has like almost like tendons underneath the bark. And the delicate branching and tiny buds create an interesting texture. And the surrounding snow shows off the bark even more. You can see down around here. Some people say the musclewood bark also um, looks kind of like elephant hide. It's also known as blue beech, sometimes it's called, or um, sometimes hop horn bean, but that can get confusing because there's another one that I'll talk about in a few slides that is sometimes referred to as the same thing. Amber chokecherry, uh, great spring flowers, good for pollinators, but for winter we want it for this great peeling coppery bark that is just this pop of electric color in the winter when there's no other color in the landscape. Next up we have Kentucky coffee tree. Kentucky coffee tree is starting to be used more and more, especially by municipalities as a street tree, because even though it's very slow growing, it's very urban tolerant. It can take pretty much the porous soils. It can take dry, it can take wet. It doesn't have um, any pest problems really. Um, and just be patient because when they're young, they look kind of awkward, but eventually they'll grow into getting this really great canopy. And it, um, much like a locust tree, it's got that compound leaf structure. So it creates a dappled shade. So you can still get shade and grow lawn underneath it. Ooh. I think all my photos are, there we go. Here is a close up of the bark. So as they get older, they get these cool um, fissures in the bark that stand out more in the winter. Oh, here's a close up of the canopy. There we go. And here's a close up of the bark in summer. Um, so this is a cousin to the muscle wood I talked about before, um, ironwood or Australia virginiana. Um, muscle wood, um, you'll find more in like lower moisture areas of the forest. Ironwood is going to be in upper, like higher, drier areas, poorer rocky soil it can handle. Um, sorry if you hear there's, good Lord, it's like there's a parade going outside my door. Sorry if you guys hear that. Um, um, in spring, they get the little catkins like a birch tree, um, great fall color. It's good for birds in the summer, and it's more small scale. Um, it's more small scale. Um, so if you're looking, if you don't have a really, <laughs> I'm really sorry with all the honking. I don't know what's going on. Um, if, you're, if you don't have room for like a big coffee tree in your yard, an ironwood or um, a musclewood are good options for people because they're not going to, they're going to stay under like 30 feet. Oh boy. Uh, but here it is in winter. So you have the little seeds for spring hanging on the tree. It's got this cool peeling bark and um, very delicate structure in winter, but it's um, a very cold tolerant tree. So it's delicate de appearance is deceiving. Okay, we're going to move on to trees um, that have cool se seeds, nuts, or fruit for winter interest. 
Um, much like the tricolor beech that's in my backyard, um, I consider an eastern redbud a four season tree. You get the spring flowers, you get the cool bark, you get the fall color, but even without the leaves, it has a really cool spreading structure. And sometimes as they get older, they do get the seed pods. These can be problematic. Sometimes they will reseed in areas. Um, usually, a lot of times the seed um, doesn't survive the winter if it's cold enough, but down in Illinois, I'm sure you guys probably have more problems with it reseeding than we do. But yeah, this is one of my favorite trees, small scale again for the yard. They can't um, have a really big tree and they can take some light shade, which is nice. Um, black alders, tech, there is a native alder, speckled alder, but it doesn't have quite as cool of an appearance in winter. These will take wet soils and I just love them for the little like mini nutlet cones that they get in winter. I like to use these for um, winter containers. Here's a close-up of it. And here's a stand of black alder in our holding yard. You see how cool they are against the winter sky. Oh, hello, coffee tree. I put you, oh, because it's bright because of the seed pods. So here's the coffee tree again. And um, the female trees, they will actually get these pods that hang on through winter. Some people don't like the pods, so you can get a male cultivar. Um, there's a couple on the market now. The most um, common one is called espresso, because these can be kind of a mess in your yard. Um, but they also look really cool on the tree, especially at around Halloween time. Here is a Winter King Hawthorne. So I talked about the um, Cockspur Hawthorne earlier. Um, the Winter King Hawthorne has a more open habit, but it also holds on to its fruit. Um, through the winter. Here's a close-up of the fruit. This is actually, I believe, at Marquette University here in Milwaukee. They've got a really cool allay of the winter cream hawthorns lining one of the sidewalks. And we'll get to this later, but you can see a lot of the perennials and grasses peeking through the snow, still giving some texture and color. Um, but really for fruit in, fall, in winter, you can't beat the crab apples. They are the queens of spring and the winter, but not all crab apples will hold onto their fruit to be enjoyed under the snow. Um, if the goal is to attract birds, um, you want to pick varieties that soften up and the sugars build up during the freezing and thawing processes. Um, golden raindrops is a great variety for this. And typically if you have yellow fruit on a crab apple, um, it means that it would had white flowers in spring. So here it is in spring, here it is in fall in our gardens. I love this photo here, just great rich colors. And then here's a close up of it in winter. This is one that's eaten usually like November, early December by the birds. But even the, and so, though sometimes I can, um, there'll still be fruit on it in December, I can use it for containers. But I just love the red um, pedicels on the fruit. Another great one for the birds is called redbud crab apple. It can get confusing. I don't mean Eastern redbud, the Circe's canadensis. It's called redbud crab apple because it has these bright red buds that open to white flowers in spring. Um, but it's really just one of the best varieties for the birds um, because it does soften up fairly early and it's almost like this great coral color. Um, Birdland crab apple um, definitely is the best one for the birds. However, it's one, this is a very old one. I'm only including it just because this is a really cool specimen we have at the nursery, but it gets um, scab and rust really bad. So it's usually defoliated by August, but it does have great fruit for the birds and holds on to a long time. So if you can find one just structurally, like for an Asian garden, it's, it's delightful. Um, now, there are also crab apples that are really only good for decoration, and that means because the fruits never actually soften up enough for the birds to eat, they stay pretty hard. Some years, if they come back early in spring and there's nothing else for them to eat, I've seen them eat these, but most of the time, the varieties I'm going to talk about next are the ones, they look cool through the winter, and then they'll make a mess on the sidewalk when they drop. Luckily, um, they're hard enough that they're usually not bushy when that happens. Uh, this is Donald Wyman crab apple. It makes an excellent screening tree. It's a consistent um, white flowering one in spring. 
And then here's a close up of the fruit. We've got harvest gold crab apple. I love it for the fall color, but also the beautiful yellow fruit. And again, white flowers, yellow fruit. This is another one of our introductions, um, the firebird crab apple. It's um, a cultivar of sergeant crab apple, but it has, um, it, it can come in either a single stem like what you see here or a shrub form but it's considered a smaller scale, topping out around about 15 feet, 12 feet. This is a basal grafted, so it's a little more spreading um, shrub form, but either way, they are usually loaded with the tiny fruits. It's pretty terrific, um, especially when you have a lot of snow and it just is a huge pop of red in the landscape. Okay, we're gonna move on to shrubs with stunning stems. Um, seven sunflower is an unusual large scale tree, um, small scale, uh, or sorry, large scale shrub, small scale tree. It blooms very late in um, the season, um, usually like around September. So not many shrubs actually bloom that time of year. You can see a close up of the flowers. And then when it's done flowering, it has these pedicels that stay on. But the close-up of the bark is, um, it gets this great texture that becomes even more noticeable in the winter. It does take a while for it to wake up in spring. So sometimes if you don't know what it is, people think, oh, my, my tree is dead. It's not, it just takes a long time to wake up. Of course, red twig dogwood. Um, there's also yellow twig dogwood, though we don't really carry the yellow twig anymore because it gets canker really bad. So we probably carry the red ones at the nursery. You really can't beat the sight of red twigs in snow. Um, we've been carrying this new variety, Arctic Fire red twig dogwood. It's um, a dwarf one, gets about, mm, let's say six feet tall instead of eight to 10. But in the fall, it gets this great um, ombre effect of color. Still great in the snow. And dogwoods generally just pair well with other shrubs too that are gonna give you fall and winter interest. Here we have them with some, looks like Annabelle hydrangeas. Shrubs with seeds, nuts, and fruit that are interesting. Uh, during the summer, an American filbert is basically just a big green shrub, um, but they transform and fall to a myriad of colors and they feed local wildlife. For winter. Um, so here is um, a bowl of hazelnut seeds from American filberts. Um, these aren't where commercial hazelnuts come from. Those are actually, um, it's a different type of filbert. Um, these are pretty small, so it takes a lot of effort to crack open the nut and actually have a filling snack out of it, but they're super cool. And I mean, they're tasty. We've been, you know, munching on them in the office. Um, but the, the seed itself is a pretty cool structure. Here's a close-up of it here and then in winter. Um, filberts also typically are pretty deer resistant, not 100%, um, but um, not much is. That's the thing about native shrubs. Usually native deer tend, you know, they've evolved with them. So a lot of the native shrubs are food over winter, like the red twig dogwoods, but I just call that natural pruning. You know, the filberts, the dogwoods, if they do get eaten over winter, they do bounce up back pretty quickly in the spring. Um, hydrangea, so many varieties out there right now. I like the limelight hydrangea a lot because it's got a really sturdy stem. I mean, it's been on the market for a long time, um, but some of the new varieties, they just don't hold up well under the load of snow. So the stems, I don't know if you can see on here, are real thick. And so they can support that big flower head during summer rains, start to turn color in the fall, and then are still looking nice in the winter. And um, thing you got to remember with um, hydrangeas, if it's, um, oh, I didn't include it in here, but like if it's got a round, if it's for shade, it's got a round head, those you can, like the Annabelles, you can cut those back. Don't cut back these woodier, sun-loving ones. They will come back, but it's just going to take a while. So how I treat mine in the yard, you just, in the spring, snip off the tips. If it's getting too big and you want to prune back a little harder than that, that's okay. But just keep in mind, 
harder you prune it back, the longer it's going to take for you to get your nice big full shrub again. Here we have um, native St. John's wort, um, loved by bees in the summer. It's kind of a delicate, airy shrub. Um, it's a good alternative like spirea for a foundation plant in a sunny area if you want to go more native. And so this is um, what it looks like in summer. Here we have the fall transition. And then here it is in winter. Now caveat, really heavy snows. We have had some issues, especially this is near our parking lot for employees. Snow gets pushed on there. We have had some breakage, but they do bounce back. But I mean, how cool is this? This is without pruning, it has that nice round shape to it. And here's a close up to the seed heads. So the center of that yellow flower will elongate and form this capsule. And if you take the, the seed head and you shake it, it actually rattles, the seeds are inside. They're very, very tiny. And I've actually seen um, in the fall and winter, um, finches and sparrows gathering around the base. And then one of the guys will get on top of the stems and they'll jump on it and shake the seeds off into the snow so their buddies can eat it. It's pretty cool. It gets even better when there's cold frost. Here's a close up there. Gosh, I love this plant. I almost didn't want to include barberries because they can be invasive. Um, so this is crimson pygmy with that red foliage. This is one called emerald carousel. We used to carry it. It makes a great hedge. It's gorgeous in fall, but it does reseed everywhere. However, the red fruit that stays on through winter is great in containers. Um, and it's just, it's really pretty. It's so cool. Here it is under winter ice. I think this picture literally was one of our company Christmas cards one year. There's red, red as a holly berry, but I don't think either of them are as cool as um, our native winter berries. So this is non-native holly, you know, like the traditional kind. Um, does not do well up around this area. I imagine in Illinois, you guys have better luck with it. But we have native winter berries that it's a deciduous holly. So um, it's just got green kind of oblong leaves in summer. And then the females are loaded with the red fruits that the birds will eat. Um, they like a sunny wet area. We actually get all of our winterberry seed from a local swamp. Um, our nursery is built outside of like basically a tamarack swamp. So we, um, we, we know the secret hiding places of where you can get the good winterberry seed. All right, we're going to move on to perennials. Um, these are snowy surprises. Um, we're going to wrap it up with um, this part. Um, personally, um, like what I like to do this time of year is leave most of the perennials and grasses up in my yard. Um, not only does it offer color and texture until spring arrives, um, but I'm also pretty tired and from a busy season to do cleanup. But if you leave the stems and the leaves on your perennials, it actually will help protect the roots if we have a really cold winter with little snow cover. And then you just clean it up in spring. So we're going to start with grasses. Um, they're just, this garden here is a lesson in texture and they grasses really hit their stride in autumn, but offer some vertical height in winter too. Um, very common Carl Forrester grass. I apologize that it cut off the title there, leave it up through winter. Um, even though it looks so delicate and you lose the wheat like seed heads, it actually is surprisingly strong under heavy snows in winter. Here it is again in really deep snow, it's held up well. If you prefer the more feathery plumage of maiden or miscanthus grasses, here it is in fall, here it is in winter. Here it is holding snow. Here it is casting really cool shadows on the snow. You need something shorter, prairie drop seed grass. Native, uh, Wisconsin native and Illinois native grass. Um, wakes up really late. That's the thing about our native grasses. A lot of them wake up very late in spring. So you're gonna be looking at nothing for a while until we get some sun and heat. Lovely, fine texture. When it starts to get its seed heads, some people say it smells like popcorn, but even with like cold rain and dew on it, it looks like little crystals. And then we transition to winter. 
and it can hold the up well in ice and snow. This is another one that the birds will eat the seeds. And actually you can see behind there, those are the St. John's wort that I talked about earlier. This is the same area. Another native grass, we have switchgrass. Here's with the seed heads covered in ice. Good vertical accent, holds up well. Again, native grass, so it wakes up late in the spring. Uh, but combining grasses with perennials like sedum um, that can hold up under piles of snow, this is, you see more and more of this in um, parking lots or um, areas with a lot of traffic, you know, snow being piled. Things like sedum, grasses, rudbeckia. This, this looks like it's probably prairie drop seed. You can see they hold up really well even in winter. Moving on to flowers, wonderful native. I think purple cone flower is probably responsible for part of the surgence in um, response to um, planting natives in landscapes again. Leave the seed heads up for the birds. It's lovely under the snow too. It's like they wear little hats of snow. Common Rebeccia plants feed the birds and also hold snow in winter. So this variety, I'm gonna go back. This variety here is probably Goldstrom. And then this is um, a tall yellow coneflower. Um, this actually might not be Rebecca. This might be Retibita, my mistake, but they're still in that um, yellow coneflower, black-eyed Susan family. Hellebores are one I often forget about. Like I keep meaning I need to plant hellebores in my yard and then spring hits and I forget that I was gonna do that. And then they're all gone because when they're in bloom, everybody wants them. They're deer resistant. They can take dry shade. So it's really a, um, those are two things that are really important for a lot of people with, um, in wooded areas. There's lots, a lot more varieties on the market. And they also, some of the varieties are holding up well better during um, hot, humid summers. They're not going dormant right away. I am a sucker for ornamental onions. Um, this is one called Ozawa ornamental onion. Um, so there's basically three core categories of alliums. You have your spring summer blooming bulbs that you, you would be planting now. Um, and then there's the summer blooming alliums. Those would be like your summer beauty or the summer peekaboo, or um, I think millennium is another one I use that they're more compact, have grass-like foliage, and they tend to bloom in like July and August. I like to leave those heads up through winter as well. This one is cool because they just started blooming now. It's very late. It's also very slow growing. So it's one we don't carry anymore. I'm pretty sure Song Sparrow Nursery used to carry these. So I'm sure these are at the Arboretum. Um, I just think they're so cool. Like even the, the leaves in fall will start to turn like a pumpkin color. And they're super tiny. So they're easy to divide. I move them all over my yard. Sometimes I put them in my fall containers. And sometimes they will keep blooming even into November and be popping up through the snow like that. And in a month, I'll be scrounging through our display gardens and picking from many of the plants I showed you to create outdoor holiday displays. So this one here, here's a list of everything I used. Here we've got Annabelle hydrangea. I probably have some limelight hydrangea in there too. This shrub back here actually is a limelight hydrangea in our display gardens. I've got arbovitae in there, red twig dogwood, of course, crab apple. Um, one thing I didn't put in there, this is anemone, um, the fall blooming plant. Um, when they are done blooming, go to seed, they get these like cotton light puff seeds, um, add a nice accent to the holiday pots. I've got um, sedum in here. Oh, I think I have a still bee heads in here. Um, allium heads, milkweed pods. Here we've got Norway spruce cones. So basically, um, I just go through with my pruners and my saw. Um, in you know, end of November after Thanksgiving, I come back and I start scrounging the display gardens to put things together for um, in front of the office and at my house. So thank you, everyone. Um, I would love to take questions from you all. Um, so Sam, if you want to open it up to that. I can. Yes. Definitely. Do you want me to? Do you want me to leave the presentation up so I can go back to refer to it, or do you want me to go back into like sure. the Zoom mode? No, that would be great. That way, if okay. um, 
if you want to go back, it's quick and easy. Thank you so much for that. That was so interesting. Um, it's kind of one of those things. Sometimes we dread winter, but now it's like, oh, wait, I can't wait to see, you know, things covered in frost. And, yeah, and I don't know how other companies do it that work, you know, further south. It's like, when you guys get a break, I guess maybe their break is when it's too hot to do anything. Maybe. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> I love having the season change. <laughs> yeah. And that helps that you guys don't do snow removal because mm. that would not be fun. <laughs> I worked for another company briefly and let me tell you being on call to answer phone calls and like go on a snow, um, route, just, it, it bro broke me. I'm like, well, I'm not doing this for long. <laughs> yeah, no, that is tough. Um, so if anybody has questions, you could go ahead and put those in the Q and A box. Um, let's see if I can pull that up. All right. I'm not seeing any questions just oh. yet. One question I get asked a lot is, what do you do in winter? <laughs> yeah, what do you do? <laughs> um, so right now, um, I'm meeting with customers for spring projects. Um, this year has been unusual. In July, we started telling people that we were booked for the season. That usually doesn't happen. It's just, you know, a combination of shortage of labor and just we were super busy. Usually we don't start telling people that until September. Wow. Um, yeah. yeah. So some people now, like if the weather holds, we can still be installing deciduous trees until the ground is frozen. So some people, like if they want a maple tree installed or a coffee tree, if the weather holds, sometimes like mid-December, we're still installing. It just depends wow. when the frost goes into the ground or when we start getting a lot of snow cover. Sure, sure. Um, we can also do... Um, like large tree installations in winter. Okay. Um, one advantage of doing that is it causes less damage to people's lawns if we do that, and it causes minimal stress on the tree. So like usually the bigger the tree, the longer it takes to get over transplant stock. So I'm talking like five inch caliper plus. Sure. What we'll do is before the ground freezes in November, we'll go out to a site, put down straw so the frost doesn't go into that portion. And then everything else freezes so we can come in with our equipment um, when the rest of the ground is frozen and um, come and install the trees. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. The only thing that sucks is that, you know, things go crooked in spring. We don't want that to happen. <laughs> to yeah, that's that. true. Sure. Um, and but yes, I'm just amassing projects that I'm going to work on over winter. Yeah. No, I can see how that would happen. Would you, um, I do see a question here, but kind of on that same scale, um, since we do still have a bit of time before the ground freezes, would you recommend, um, you know, adding a few of those things into the landscape mm -hmm. um, now? Uh, you know, sometimes you could find them uh, with a good deal at the landscape exactly. centers too. And so you yeah. might as well get those in and yeah. Is that yeah, um, good for you? So generally, I tell people to get their evergreens and perennials in by end of October. Sure. And um, I thought I had a slide about bulbs, but I might have deleted it. Um, you know, this is also the time that you can plant all your um, yeah. bulbs for spring yep. in the yard. Um, you just don't want to do it when it's still pretty warm. So I haven't done mine yet. And that's mostly just because I haven't had time, but I'll probably be doing them in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah typically native stuff you can push it a little more like into November um you know the climate changing we have been getting longer milder falls which has been nice sure. Sure, um sure. but deciduous trees you basically can go until the ground is frozen evergreens like pines and spruces definitely the cutoff I would say it would be end of October just because they shut down different than deciduous stuff does they're more at risk of um drying out over winter if we move mm -hmm. them too late sure Yep. Um, all right. So let's get to a question here real quick. What do you think of burning bushes? I think they're beautiful in the fall and the branch structure holds onto snow. That is true. Um, burning bushes. I mean, people love that fall color, right? Problem is if, if you love burning bushes in the next five years, buy them if you want them because they will end up on the invasive species list. They've every year with milder winters, like it's they're reseeding in areas. And um, every year, like more and more varieties are being taken off the market. Right now, we only carry the compact burning bush. Standard burning bush is horrible for reseeding. Don't buy that. Okay. And compact, compact, it can still get pretty tall. Um, 
but there are some other varieties that are real short, slow growing. Um, see, we had one called Rudy Hague, and we're talking stuff that stays under four feet tall. Um, I think we had one called Little Moses, get it, because burning bush. Yep. <laughs> um, but they grow really slow and the rabbits usually eat them over winter. So if you're going to go that route, you need to provide some sort of protection from the rabbits. And even the big burning bushes, if you have a hard winter, they will um, chew all the bark around the base. And sometimes that can kill your burning bush down the road. So great shrub. If you like them, get them now because <laughs> yeah. you might not be able to get them in five years. Do you ever recommend um, using like a father gilla instead? They have, you know, um, mm -hmm. A nice red color um, might be a, I kind of tend to recommend that as a, a replacement. Beaver Creek Father Yella. <laughs> oh, we do have a few of those. I actually, we've, I think we've got a few on the property and we included them in our, our plant sale this past spring. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, now that, um, now that Song Sparrow is closed, a few things that um, we had clem ties to, we uh, have a hard time getting uh, our hands on now. Yeah. I really like the Beaver Creek variety. Um, Father Gilly, you guys probably have better luck with them than we do up here. Um, I know like if you're closer to the lake up here, um, hardiness should be fine. But like when we get out to more of the Western suburbs, I've definitely had problems with them. Plus we have horrible clay soils and they okay. don't like that. Sure, also the sure. rabbits like them. So it's another one I got to protect. Um, yeah. But I, I love it for fall. I think it's awesome. Yeah, I love that fall color and just a nice surprising pop of um, those bottle brush flowers in spring. So really like them, but they do require a little more maintenance for us around here. Sure. Okay. Understandable. Um, another question came in. What about nine barks? What do you think of those? Nine barks are great. Um, native shrub and it does have some winter interest as well because it gets those seed heads. Sure. And um, the peeling bark can be interesting in winter. Um, Powdery mildew has been a problem with them, however. Like straight native nine barks, the green ones, they're not as showy, though they do have great fall color. People tend to not like those as much just because they're not as showy as the purple leafed ones. The purple leaf varieties, the ones we're carrying now predominantly are Center Glow. We do that one instead of the Diablo because it seems to be somewhat more resistant to powdery mildew and also um, doesn't revert to green as much. I still see it happen occasionally, though. Sure. And then of the dwarf ones, there's one called Little Joker I like. Mm -hmm. That seems to be more stable as well and doesn't get the powdery mildew as bad. So with, with nine barks, it's just that mildew you got to watch for. And what it comes down to is don't put it, especially the purple ones, don't put them in a shady spot. The green ones can take shade. The purple ones cannot. They'll survive, but you'll get those disease problems and you won't have as good a color on them either. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, all right, let's see. I don't know other questions um, that I'm seeing here. Um, a question I would have, what, um, what about like the, like a shrub type willow for winter interest? Cause I know that there's a few more coming out with more colorful stems with the yellows and whatnot. Um, do you mm -hmm. know any good varieties of those? Um, That's a good question. I'm trying to think um, of the one. Dappled willow, yes, yeah. cheeky. that's a real popular one. And that yep. one can have some color on the stems. We've been having problems with overwintering those. We've been getting really? a lot of tip dye back up here. Okay. Okay. So I, that's probably more of an us problem than a you guys problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It depends. I mean, we, uh, we're not too far off, but, um, but yeah, it's good to know. I've been trying to scope out some places on the grounds to put some. <laughs> I do like them though, but we just, we were having, a, we don't grow it ourselves. It's one we source from other vendors and we just could not oh, get sure. our hands on it because there was a lot of, you know, replacements this year and we just okay. didn't have anything to replace them with. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Hmm. Any other questions from the audience? Are the emerald greens sturdy enough for severe ice? Yes, though the young, I have seen them splay open. So sometimes you have to do the pantyhose trick to keep them together. But the key is when you're like shopping for them, don't pick one that has like the three tops like that. You want to pick ones that are more pointed where it's got like that strong leader. And then like the other guys are a little shorter. So you want that tip on it because that way the, the ice will sheet off a little more when it starts getting kind of wedgy 
that's when it's going to splay open. Okay. And also when we have these ice storms, it's important to get out there as soon as possible and like, you know, shake it off. And I realize sometimes that is impossible. Um, sure, and sure. when they do splay open though, the key is, you know, if you can support it so it doesn't continue to go. And then in spring, usually you can get them to go back up. Okay. Um, another question here uh, points out that you didn't mention didn't mention about witch hazel or dutzia. Do you have any thoughts mm. on those? Um, yeah, um, witch hazel. Around here, we um, predominantly do the common witch hazel, the one that blooms late in the season. Um, good structure for winter as well. And then you've got like the little seed pods that are cool. And um, some years, the witch hazel around here is not blooming yet. So sometimes it'll be blooming when it's there's snow. Oh, the spring blooming witch hazel, the vernal witch hazel doesn't like alkaline soil. So we struggle with that one around here. But if you have acidic soil, it's a great one to plant if you want something. It's called vernal because it usually happens around the spring equinox. So it can be blooming when there's snow in spring. And then Ditsia, um, I guess I never really think of that one as a winter one. I do love Ditsia because it's got the, um, I'm always looking for something like a low shrub, especially as an alternative to like Rolo sumac, something a little more interesting. So I like the different flower colors that are coming out. Um, great fall color, though I guess texturally, um, yeah, that would be good for winter. It's just, you know, sometimes it's going to be covered in snow because it is lower. True. And some people, some people don't like that um, leaves get trapped in it. That's true. That is true. Um, all right. Any, any others? Get your last questions in if you might have some. Now, um, question I guess that I'll ask real quick. Um, for you mentioned um, red buds, we have been mm -hmm. trying to find. Do you grow a lot of different um, cultivars of them? Because I've know we've been no. watching. There are some <laughs> new ones coming out. Yeah, we haven't found any of the cultivars, like the um, the weepers or yeah. um, the ones with like different color flowers to be yeah. hardy up here. Okay. We only carry, we used to do, um, it was called the Columbus strain, that there's this pocket of in Columbus, Wisconsin, that even though redbud isn't technically native to Wisconsin, um, there's a, like the red butts in, up in that area had been growing so long that the ecotype actually got hardier, like genetically speaking. Oh, yeah. But then when we had the polar vortex, they were not. So now we're doing a Minnesota strain coming out of, um, university of Minnesota, um, okay. through Bailey's nursery. That's where we're, um, getting all of our red buds that we plant in the fields that we grow in pots are the Minnesota strain now. Sure. And so far it's been fine. Um, yeah. but yeah, I, none of the cultivars so far, we'll get contractors asking us to special order and we're like, okay, but it's not under warranty. Yeah, no, that's true. It seems like they're, they're NC state has bred a couple ones that are neat and I'm like, oh, I wish I was a little further South. <laughs> yeah. I, I love red buds. I'm a sucker for them. They don't like it wet though. So our clay soil, it can be problematic. So you got to get, yeah. you know, I have to be careful about where I cite them Sure. or we sure. just, we plant them high. Yeah, that's true. Um, I, another question here. What do you think about the blue Chinese wisteria tree? Oh, so wisteria tree. So wisterias are typically a vine, but you can get them where they've actually been like trained into a tree form. Sure. Um, we didn't used to carry many wisterias and now we're getting more winter hardy versions. I think, um, what were the ones we carried this year? I think um, like Blue Cascade, um, Amethyst Falls. Um, I think that's a dwarf one. So there are more cold tolerant ones coming onto the market. Sure. The tree form ones, honestly, I haven't tried just because in the past they usually would die on me. <laughs> so we just stick to the um, the vining ones. So we, I think maybe we did have a tree form this year, it, but it was like a, a cold hardy variety that had just been trained up higher. That was all. It wasn't actually a tree. Sure, sure. It's interesting how they can do that with, uh, you know, good training and everything, get them, get them upright. 
All right. Well, um, if there are no more questions, um, I do want to say thank you again so much, Carrie, for being with us. And thank you to everybody who joined us. Um, again, if you can make it out to the Arboretum sometime, um, you know, this week, this month, uh, we're waiting for, for more fall, fall colors to start turning. Hopefully there will still be uh, plenty to see in the weeks to come. Um, uh, come on out and see what all's changing. Again, we've got the smartphone tour and scavenger hunt that you could try out. And then, um, yeah, if you um, want to share this presentation with anybody that you know, we're going to put it on our website as well. So you can let your friends know and, and go back and check out those varieties again as well um, in case you, you missed one to write down. So thank you again so much and have a great evening. Thank you.